Welcome everyone to the Silvermine Art Center. It's a pleasure to have this special program on artist residencies here at Silvermine because being part of a supportive community for artists is our mission. I hope that you all get a chance to see the fabulous exhibition that we have right now in our galleries called Reframing Aging, Health, Happiness and the Arts. Ten artists are represented. Their boundless energy and ingenuity and lifelong creativity is being celebrated in this exhibition. We also have a series of programs accompanying the exhibition, which are funded by the Connecticut Humanities, including our opening lecture, which already took place, and you're gonna to have to come back on Sunday to hear me give a lecture and have a conversation called Better With Age, <laughs> and we mean it. Um, artists, being an artist is a way of life, and you get better with age. I did not say that. Faith Ringgold made that comment. She is actually an honorary member of the Silvermine Guild of Artists. She's 88 years old, and her work in a variety of media is absolutely an inspiration. I will be talking about the brilliance, the late in life brilliance of artists from Titian, in other words, from the Renaissance up to the present day, and then we're going to have a fabulous panel that will include a number of the outstanding artists who are represented in our exhibition. And then you have to come back yet again on the 23rd of March. Grab a kid, it could be your child, your grandchild, a neighbor's child, your niece, your nephew, because we're going to have storytelling and art making activities that are going to be a lot of fun. So today is gonna to be a lot of fun too because it's absolutely a joy to have all of you here and to have the Cultural Alliance of Fairfield County here. So now I'm going to throw it over to David Green. Thank you, Robin, very much. So I first want to well, uh, thank Robin and um, um, Roger for uh, welcoming us and allowing us to um, uh, use this wonderful space at Silvermine. So thank you for that. So um, welcome to this uh, example of one of the professional development programs that we do at the Cultural Alliance. Cultural Alliance, as most of you probably realize, is uh, a membership service organization with close to 600 members, 300 organizations roughly, and 300 individual artists. And um, I hope if you don't receive our weekly e-buzz, our uh, suggested uh, 20 best items in, uh, happening in Fairfield County, then um, I'm, let me know and we can, we can show, show you an example. So I want to get straight to it and uh, t tonight we, we are very um, um, happy to welcome Felicity Hogan from the New York Foundation for the Arts who has come to give us an overview of uh, the residency experience. She has much experience herself in organizing residences and speaking at residences. And then she will speak for about 15 minutes. And then three of our artist members will talk about their experience on a variety of residences, each for about eight minutes. And then um, we will have a question time at the end. And I'm uh, vowing to end by quarter to six so that we can get to know one another. There, is, there are refreshments at the back of the room. Um, so um, I hope we can manage to stay on time. Please hold your questions um, for each speaker until the end so that we can have all the questions together and maybe your question will be answered by another speaker. I, I'd now like to introduce the speakers one by, by one so you know who you're hearing. Uh, Felicity, uh, would you like to wave as I announce your... <laughs> Felicity Hogan has been the director of NIFA Learning at the New York Foundation for the Arts for the last nine years. And NIFA, as you probably know, provides professional development for artists and arts administrators. And some of those programs include the Artist as Entrepreneur and the Immigrant Artist Program. 
trained as an artist in the UK with two master's degrees in fine art from the University of Brighton and Camberwell College of Arts. Felicity worked in New York first um, at the Lower East Side print shop and was then executive director of the Artists Alliance in New York before moving to the New York Foundation for the Arts. Our next speaker will be uh, Susan Newbold. Susan. Susan is a painter and printmaker now living in Black Rock, Bridgeport with a studio at the AmFab Studios in Bridgeport. She has degrees from the New York School of Interior Design, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and an MFA from Vermont College. Susan has been on a very wide range of residences. She's been a member of the Silvermine Guild of Artists since 2003, um, Art Place in Fairfield, and the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Norwalk. Jay Petrow, our next speaker, um, Jay is a Westport-based painter who graduated from Middlebury College with a degree in studio art and biology, and then took courses in advertising art direction at SVA in New York, going on to be an assistant director at, uh, art director at Time Magazine, and then art director, senior art director, and international art director for Business Week and McGraw-Hill companies through 2007, when he then had a change of heart. <laughs> took a certificate in landscape design at the New York Botanical Garden and set up his own landscape design firm in Westport. So if you need your garden, if your garden needs attention, uh, Jay's your man. Cars. <laughs> <laughs> Jay has been taking classes here at, the, at Silvermine since 2010 and just came back from his first artist residency. And our third speaker is Liz Leggett who is a Westport-based painter who majored in studio art at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, later completing her MFA at the Maine College of Art in Portland. Liz has been on a wide range of residences, as you will hear, is a member of the Silvermine Guild of Artists, as well as the Artists Collective of Westport, and is the exhibition manager for the Westport Art Center. Liz recently had a solo show at that new Newton Rue Gallery in Westport, and currently is in a group show uh, about to end at the National Arts Club in New York. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Felicity. Take it away, Felicity. Okay. Let me get you started. Thank you, David. And thank you to the Silver Mine Arts Centre for having, having us and having me here. I'm really delighted to be um, away from the city and in such beautiful surroundings and just, uh, it just feels very fresh and, and I'm really uh, happy to be with you today. Um, I'm going to actually ask David to give me a one minute warning because um, I want to make sure that we hear from all the artists and they get the time to speak as well. I don't want to run over at all. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Residencies, um, and I was just talking to Liz about this, there are so many, 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 many residencies. There are residencies in the desert, in, in rural places, there's residencies in cities, there's residencies on cruise ships, there's residencies in the Arctic, there's residencies all around the world, right? So, um, and they're all different. Some are short, some are long, some are funded, some have costs. You know, so there's, there's so many different things to think about. So one of the reasons I have this up here and this quote, this is Rosemary Fiore. She's a, a really amazing art, artist and one of our artist fellows. She's also been mentoring our immigrant artists for about uh, four years now. She's really um, supportive to all of them. And she uh, just says here, you know, she really uh, talks about her goal in applying to a residency. It's for a specific type of work. But your goal can also be um, related to your career practice. You might be thinking five years down the line. Maybe you're someone who wants to have an international presence. Well, then you can focus on international residencies. That, that at least um, targets your search, right? So, and when I did a residency, I did a, a, a very specific residency that was for someone like myself, who was originally a painter and a printmaker. Um, but when I came to the States, I started curating and producing, and I ended up doing um, 
uh, becoming more of an arts administrator. So there's a, a residency in New York City called Shift, which is specifically for people like me, um, to help us kind of reconnect with our artistic practice. And we had a two week residency. And I went into that with a very specific goal. I was like, okay, I have two weeks. I'm going to buy um, about, I think I bought about 50 canvases of various sizes, some paper that, um, a book of paper, special paper that a friend had bought me from England. And um, I went into the space and I just said, I'm just going to play for two weeks and make. And that was my goal. And I actually did do exactly that. I produced a lot of space lot of work and um, had a great time and really felt like um, I achieved those goals. So I just wanted to really kind of name that and acknowledge that, that that's really helpful if you're thinking about applying to residencies. Um, the next thing is just think about what type of residency if you're, you're looking for, what are your needs? Do you, are you someone that needs a lot of equipment? Are you someone working in a specific medium? that needs that support? Are you looking for a break? Do you want to be in the city because you're out in the country? Do you want to be out in, in a city in another in, internationally? Um, so thinking about all of those things, do you want to look for a residency where your family can come along? Um, there's, there's a real trend in the residency field uh, for family-friendly residences, so you could actually bring along a partner or bring along children. Um, so that's something that you could actually search for when you do your research. So what are your needs? Um, and how long do you have? Do you, can you only go at a certain time of year? Is there a certain, are you only able to take a certain amount of time off work? Thinking about those things can really help you focus in and target your research. And another thing around budget, um, what's your budget? Some of these residencies do cost. Some of them have support and they have stipends, but a lot of them do have fees. Um, and you need to understand what those fees are and what they're for. And you, you can always ask. I, I would just say, anytime something isn't clear with a residency, um, especially with international ones, and I, I think it's great that Liz is here to talk about um, her experience in Spain. Um, sometimes uh, it, it can be a little vague uh, with, uh, with residency, especially if you're finding them on a website. You may need to actually reach out to them and say, okay, what are these costs for? I need more information. And if you don't hear back from them, then there's probably something, something going on there, right? So. And then another thing is scholarships. So uh, we, we uh, in Knife for Learning, we have a, an immigrant artist newsletter that's focused on opportunities for immigrant artists. And there was a really great residency. And the fee to apply was, was you know, it was about 40 or 45. Um, and so we reached out and said, well, you know, that's actually, usually we try and do um, uh, applications that are free to apply. But sometimes we do say there's a fee. Um, but that's quite a high fee for us, so tell, tell me a little bit more about it. And they immediately responded and said, well, actually, they can ask for a scholarship. Anyone can, you can ask for a scholarship for the fee. You don't have to pay the fee. Um, and so there are uh, often scholarship, scholarships towards the fee, but there's also scholarships towards the cost. So um, if you're feeling like you can see there's some costs involved in terms of um, maybe staying, uh, paying for accommodation or something like that, then um, just see what the options are. Um, this is a little bit about locating opportunities. Well, uh, tonight is a great way to locate opportunities. You're going to hear about all these residencies from our artist friends here tonight. Um, and word of mouth. And word of mouth is really good because then you get the reputation. You hear about the residency. Is it a good residency? Is there things about it that it are good, but things about it that are not so good? Um, so, you know, the word of mouth is really good for that. Not only finding out about things, but seeing whether it's, it's got a good reputation in the field, which is important too. Um, websites, um, we, we actually... Um, David and I collaborated on this. Yeah. And um, so there's some really good resources for you to look, 
look for in there, and we can email it afterwards if people would like. Um, and then there's also databases. Uh, NIFA has a really good database. It's called NIFA Source, and um, it has uh, about 13,000 opportunities on it, not just residencies, um, and it's in nationwide and international. Uh, that you can filter as well by location and certain keywords, uh, which is really great. They have a hotline um, from Monday to Friday from 3 to 5 p.m., and that means that you could actually talk to somebody on the phone and say, look, I'm, I'm thinking about applying to residencies. Can you give me some um, ways that I can research? Could you repeat the name? Oh, source. It's like water source, not tomato sauce. It's my accent. Source. Source. S-O-U-R-C-E. Dot It's actually dot org. But you can find it on NIFA's site. It's right, it's online resources and you'll see uh, NIFA source. Um, and you can all also email them at NIFA, you can also email them at source at nifa.org. <laughs> and you can say you came to this panel and you have some questions about residences. Um, social media is a really great way as well. Um, there's lots of groups of people sharing opportunities. Um, Nonprofits and arts councils, you know, just great resources for information. And conferences and panels like tonight, but I, I wanted to mention the transcultural um, conference. I don't know if any of you have been to that. Um, it's in different places. It's been in Boston. I think it was in Quebec last time, um, but it's, uh, it's run by the Artist, uh, Artist Alliance of Communities, which is one of the sites on here. Um, and they bring together um, residency, people from residencies from all over the world, and then lots and lots of artists go there. Um, and then there's also things like the College Art Association that also does their conference that we were just at recently. So keep an eye out for those kind of convenings where you'll just, there's a lot of word of mouth. So these are the email version. Um, so you can send this out afterwards, yeah? It will be actually on our website. And okay. I should point out that the video will be available of this session on our YouTube site as well. Okay, so a couple of these. I'm just going to point out a couple of these because, uh, say, Retitle is actually from, uh, from England. Um, so they have a lot of international opportunities. So that's definitely worth a look at the enail.org has a, a you can subscribe and they send out a, a sort of list of world deadlines and opportunities and it's it's really expansive and sometimes you just find really unusual residencies there so um, uh, it comes out of Europe um, so it's just a really interesting site and and then some of these you can actually filter so you can do that targeted search that we talked about earlier on um, you can filter by location, by time, by discipline. Um, so definitely sort of check out those uh, sites when you have a chance. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about relationships. Um, you know, the, one of the best things, and I'm, I, I suspect you might be talking about this as well, um, is, is, you know, it's an opportunity to build relationships with other artists. Um, it's an opportunity to meet the people who run the program, people like myself who run the program. You become allies of every artist that goes through your program. You watch their careers, you support their careers. Um, the arts professionals that visit these, these um, residencies, they also become your allies too. They're people that know about you and you can stay in touch. Um, and then the organisations themselves, often they're really passionate about supporting their alumni and they become, you know, you can let them know about what's happening after you've been in that residency and they keep spreading the word about you because they're, they're sort of invested in you as well. Um, and I think one of the things about, if you're interested in, say, collaboration or something like that, um, that community that you're spending time with, you can actually, 
actually a lot of these uh, residencies will have an opportunity for you to do an artist talk so you can really be upfront about some of the things you're looking to do while you're on the residency and then people can hear oh, oh that person's interested in collaboration and just sort of set it out up front because uh, especially when you're maybe not together for a long time um, but definitely uh, some of the residencies where people are you know living on site um, there's definitely a really sort of long lasting and very you know special bond uh, working with each other Three minutes. Okay. so you know um, applying that's another part of this process. And so I just have some really basic tips um, about just being prepared and ready, have your materials ready, um, being, you know, being, following the guidelines is one of the most important things because um, it's so easy to miss something. Um, ask questions about the process. If they're showing your work, ask them if they're showing it like this or are they showing it on a computer screen? Are they showing images one off to the other or are they showing them in a group? It's very different to how you would put together your images based on the way somebody's uh, projecting it and looking at it. And then you're also thinking about the fact that people are sitting in a room and they might be looking at a thousand images and you're part of that thousand and you have that three to six minutes, right? Which is not great. And, and it's not necessarily fair, but it's also the reality. Um, so the more understanding you have of the process, uh, the more chances you'll put together uh, images or work that aligns with the process that's happening. Um, getting feedback from your colleagues and friends, whether that's they're looking at your work samples, maybe they're looking at your uh, description of a proposal that you've done, maybe they're looking at your artist statement as well. Definitely share things uh, with your friends to get feedback. Um, when we're in our artistic process sometimes we're very close to it and it's really hard for us to take uh, take a step back so when someone else looks at it um, you really get that sense okay I can do it um, here are some other tips um, about uh, the application um, just some ways of thinking about how you put and really I think also the approach your application as a creative project your artwork is never going to look like the artwork it's going to be in your studio when it translates to this kind of application process. So I think that's a really great way of thinking about it that, um, because you, you can't sort of make your work match. Um, it's not going to look like your artwork when it's projected on a screen like this, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then artist statements, definitely specific, clear and concise, you know, really... Keep it brief. If, if you've got long sentences, uh, one of the best things to do is read it out loud or read it to a friend or have a friend read it back to you. That's a really great experience because you suddenly realise, oh, that, that looked really great written down, but actually that's a really long sentence and it's not making sense, right? That's it. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs>
And my whole goal, and we talked about goals, was I wanted to paint large. I, I didn't have an opportunity to do that here when I was taking classes or at home. I didn't really have a studio either. So I wanted a studio, and I wanted to paint big. And then five years ago, when I started painting abstract paintings, I had this thought in mind of sort of mixing representational images with abstract backgrounds. So my goal then was to really do those two things, but really the, the main goal was just to work, because I never worked for eight, eight hours a day on my craft. So I just wanted to see what happens if I put in eight to ten hours every day over a period of two weeks, um, which I did, and it was great. I mean, it was the best art experience I've ever had, hands down, no problem. But first, I just want to show you a couple of things, like what it looks like at the residency and talk about like what the average day was. Um, the CCA, CCA has got 25 creative people, so they're writers, they're poets, they're composers, and they're visual artists. So out of the 25, there are only eight visual artists. Um, we're called fellows, and that's sort of, I hadn't really thought of myself, but we actually are. Um, it, it, they, the property now, they've been doing it for 50 years. This used to be part of Sweetbriar College, which is across the street. Um, so we sort of live in a dorm. Um, this is a, the bedroom, a single room, single bed, very plain but clean, and you shared a bathroom with your neighbor. Um, they also had beds in all the studios so people could take naps, which people seem to like. Um, or you could sleep over in the studio. There were actually showers and bathrooms in the studio space. Uh, I didn't do that. Um, actually, someone had moved my bed my, out of my studio. The bed had been moved out, and I said, okay, I'm not going to sleep here, so that's fine. Um, they give you meals here, so some of the residencies, you don't have meals, but here they give you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You don't have to shop, you don't have to cook, you don't have to clean up, so it's great. This is the dining room, so it's really just come in and people start sitting down and you know chatting. Um, the, the dorm is about a five minute walk from where the studios are, which is in this barn. There was a stone thing. This is the studio space. They had this, this great silo, which I, I loved. Um, I took like 100 pictures of it. Um, it always changed with the light. Um, this little cottage here was a little composer's cottage. I think they had a piano in there. And um, so the writer's studio is actually, I never went into the studio. One of the things about VCCA, I'm not sure it's the same as some other residencies, but there was like no mingling among the creative people. Like you would go to breakfast, you would leave breakfast, everyone would disappear, they'd go behind their door, their studio, close the door, and then they'd come out for lunch, <laughs> and everyone would disappear again, and then you'd come out for dinner. <laughs> and it was social at those meal times, but when you were working, like, you weren't even, like it was, a message was given the first day, like, don't even knock on the door, like, don't interrupt someone's creative process. So that was a little different because I was used to working in here with other artists. Um, but it sort of forced me to really focus on my work, which was the best thing. Now, it's, it's very pretty here and it did snow. In the summer, if you apply and you get in, they do have a pool. So there's probably more outdoor activities. Um, there was a ping pong table in the basement. So we did have some late night ping pong. Um, being a landscape designer, I did like the boxwoods. This is a boxwood. It was 25 feet tall. Uh, I think they were pretty incredible. There is a little town, and we went to the thrift shop one day. Um, it's, it's like within a five, ten minute drive, but some of the people didn't have cars. So I, I happened to drive my truck. Um, took walk, so it's very rural. Um, so there are different artists there. This, this happens to be a piece. This guy, he was on residency after residency and he painted with toothpicks. And he would spend like four months painting this sort of like three-dimensional thing. And so I did, I ended up doing 30 paintings in two weeks and he was working on that. It, it didn't seem to change, but you know, <laughs> it's really about the process <laughs> and, and not the result. <laughs> Um, this was another artist. Yeah, you see the bed, and the, she was into mixed media. She was a musician and a writer, and 
she got in as a visual artist into the, in this case, and um, she had like a little video she showed us. Um, interesting stuff. People were really talented and interesting. So this was my studio when I moved in. Um, sort of looks like this, big white walls, white tables. Um, I brought on my canvases. I put up a 10 foot by eight foot canvas and I said, holy, <laughs> like how am I gonna fill that up? <laughs> and then I just got to work and uh, also I brought these little toys to part of what I was working on, which I'm not gonna go into because it's about residencies. <laughs> But you see little SpongeBob over there? <laughs> he shows up later. So I started working and started small just to loosen up and then um, got bigger. Um, it was great because here, I, I, never, I don't have a studio at home so I always would have to bring all my stuff, bring it home. Here I could just leave it out and, uh, and work, which was amazing. So there's SpongeBob and some of the other things uh, I'm not going to go into why, but um, some of my friends were questioning, you know, like, what's going on there? <laughs> um, the big question that most people had, like, why are you going to a residency? Like, what classes are you taking? What are they teaching you? And it's not at all like that. Um, my instructor here, Elise Rosner, she said, you'll like, <clears throat> the work that you do at your residency will really inform you for years to come. And I just didn't get that and it just seemed like, well, it seems like a thing to do and I don't have a studio and I want to work big, so those are my reasons. But um, I would say that working, I did work really 10 to 12 hours a day. I clocked in on my phone. I had a little app because I keep track of my landscape hours. And my work changed during that time. It really changed and I started developing things and some of the imagery that I worked on when I was like 12 years old came back, like just, I don't know, it just came up. And um, so here I am, this is the 10 foot by seven foot one. So one thing that's nice there is that you can, you can do an open studio towards the end and for 15, 20 minutes after dinner, sometimes a writer would do a reading or a poet would do something uh, I did open my studio. There was a writer who actually read, so we had a reading and an art opening. Um, and I explained, you know, my work. This is actually one of the paintings that just sort of changed everything for me. Um, and then this was a series I developed. Um, this is the last one. So this was the, like the artist talk and get some wine and hang out. And, um, it was very interesting to have all these different um, people give their perspective on what I was doing. And, um, you know, my work happens to, I initially started working on it because my son's autistic and I wanted to express myself. And that's where some of these more realistic imagery came in. And so I explained that and then people really gave me some interesting feedback. And one guy told me that he's actually dating an autistic man and didn't realize, but he was, he was looking at a video and he, he looked in the, his computer, this, this guy, his boyfriend had, and he'd watched the video like 8,000 times, like, and it was like a door closing. And he said it was all about control. Whenever the guy <coughs> would lose control, he would watch this video of a door closing. And it, it's just interesting to connect with these people in such, such a great way. So, One minute. Yeah, so VCCA actually has an alumni group and a Facebook group, and like, like you were saying, um, so hopefully we'll stay connected. Um, again, this was like some, some image that I had done when I was like 10, 12 years old, and I started doing this again. But it, it's a great way to just work intensely over a period of time. You're totally undisturbed. You know, I would go back and work till one, two in the morning sometimes. Some of the writers would work early, you know, you're, you have your own schedule and you can just um, somehow feel free to just focus on your work and that's, that's what it's about. So I actually have a, another residency this August. I'm gonna be at Weir Farm, so I'm gonna be the only one there. So it'll be very different. Um, but all these people, they came year after year after year, not only to VCCA, but some of them had been there eight, 10 times I'm planning on doing this every year now. So, <laughs> anyway, it's great. Do it. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Jeff. Susan?
Well, I, I, uh, I'm glad Jay went before me because I first found out about, that, that was my first residency at the VCCA and it was a very big deal for me to go there and um, drive down there and unload all your stuff and it was fun to see those pictures again of it. So if you uh, are able to get into that program, you are eligible for their international programs. And they, um, the VCCA has uh, a really wonderful residence. They have several uh, international residencies, but they'll have, they have like one or two slots at them. Like there's one in Ireland and there's one in uh, Majorca and Germany. And, um, but this one is their biggest one and they usually have like between four and six residents there at a time. And it's in, um, Ovilar, France, which is just to the uh, west of Toulouse. So you fly to Paris and then you fly to Toulouse. And I applied to this, didn't get in, and <clears throat> about two weeks before it was to start, I got a call saying, if you want to go, there's an open spot. <laughs> and so I had to scramble together and it was like, just blew off everything and went and I was so happy that I did because it was probably um, the most, uh, how do I even describe it? It was just, it, it was one of the, a life changing experience for me, it really was. And when David put out the call for speaking about artist residencies, I couldn't wait to talk about it because it's one of my favorite topics. It did so much for me. So this is, um, it's, uh, it's on this river, it's called the Garonne River, and Ovilar means high up city. And it's a city that was built, this is, these are all views from the, from the town. It was a city that was built in 1200 by the Romans. So it's just a wonderful, uh, historic, amazing town. And when I first got there, I just couldn't believe it. I, it was, I felt like the luckiest person in the world. And I did a lot of work just sitting on this wall when I first got there. It was a long climb up the hill. The residency was down below and it was a very steep climb. It's actually part of that um, very famous, and I'm forgetting the name of it, um, the, the walk that goes through France and Spain. Yes, thank you. Yes, so you see them all the time walking up this hill. And this is, this continues to be views from up there. I went in the fall. This is, I went back in the summer. I've been there three times now. And uh, this was, each time was really different. And the surrounding countryside is just amazing. It's. Uh, that it's the Garonne Valley, I don't know if you, if you know it, or, and it's borders on the Dordogne, so it's a gorgeous part of France. So we, we painted a lot outside, which was wonderful. We, October is still really warm there. We went at the beginning of October. It's such a rich color palette. But these are the streets in the little town. And this is where they have the open market on Sundays which is fabulous. There's a couple of very cute little restaurants. This is a big town square. This is a little hotel where you can go and have a drink at the end of the day and just people watch. This, these are all the towns. So we, at the time, now it's different, but at the time we lived in a Airbnb up in the town and I live with a, another woman who was a poet laureate of Virginia at the time and just really fun getting to know a writer and their process. We had, um, there's a quite an expat community there. They're mostly Brits and they, they are very welcoming. They, they're very supportive of the, of the residency and of the artists there. So they have you over. This is a, to me, one of the reasons to go in June, there is this fabulous sunflower, I guess you call them crops, everywhere. They're just extraordinary. So this is, um, this is the actual studio building. 
Yeah, these two buildings were left by an individual, a patron of VCCA, uh, just gave it to them, uh, gave them some money to run it for a few years, and it gets a lot of support, and these are the actual studios. The, the two open windows on the end were my, were my studio. Great windows. This is my view out the window. They have also a open studio at the end where they invite the town. This lady I'm talking to is the postmaster. And they just invite everyone and they are, they're so enthusiastic and that's a great. And this is lunchtime. And this is a good perspective. The river is over here and the studio buildings look out on the river. And the building to the right is the office where you can go and do your email and that type of thing. And these two artists, one is from Berkeley, California, and the other one was from um, Iceland or something like that. So that's the other part that, as Jane mentioned, is just so great. You meet, you meet people from all over. And this, the woman you just saw, and she's in this picture too, she was, um, she and I went to another residency the following year together in New Zealand, which was really wonderful. I had been in graduate school doing a lot of, you know, required edgy work, and so I really got back into the landscape, and that, <laughs> that was just really refreshing and, and wonderful for me. They had these huge chestnut trees everywhere, and I had a great time. That, that kind of got me started. I think one of the challenging parts of a residency is that you get there and it's so daunting because everybody is, some people just hit the ground running and they get everything up and they get going and I was just kind of like, whoa, this is <laughs> so amazing. And um, had the same experience that Jay had. Everyone kind of um, closed their doors and didn't come out and I said to one person, well, how about we have lunch together in the middle of the, oh no, I don't want to do lunch, no, no. <laughs> so it was really good for me to, to be around this kind of discipline. And this gives you some idea of the studio. There's a couple of great tables. When, we, when I was there in the summer, they had this amazing wine festival that the whole town just turned upside down for, and that was quite a cultural event. I think that really getting to know a culture is just a real gift, too. I love that part. This is out in the courtyard. So I just want to speak briefly about the Vermont Studio Center. A lot of people, a lot of you know about it. I happen to be on the board there, the privilege of being there for four years. And it's fabulous. It's up in Johnson, Vermont. It's near the Canadian border. This is the one of the studio buildings. They have great accommodations, wonderful food. You want to go somewhere where they have good food. <laughs> um, this is it in the winter time, which I happen to prefer. It's gorgeous. Great. And we have some brochures on that. Yes, thank you. So I will just give you a quick background. After college, graduating undergraduate college, I went to New York. Um, was working at a, at a graphic designer, had a really great uh, couple of years, and I had never been abroad. And I said to myself, I was around 24 years old, okay, it's time. And I had a friend that was in um, Israel, and she had done a residency that was for a year, and um, she had then been living in Tel Aviv. And I applied, I didn't even actually tell her, because I just sort of put it out to the world that I'm gonna apply, and I got in. And I spent a year in Arad, Israel. And uh, it's sort of just a suburban town in the middle of the desert, um, and it was the greatest year of my life. Um, it was part of a larger, art, uh, it was part of a larger uh, program for Jewish studies, but a bunch of artists were invited. And uh, we had studios, uh, and I lived there for a year and was incredibly uh, prolific. When I left New York and went to Israel, I didn't really have any money, and I had been working a few jobs, but one of my jobs uh, was for a high-end printing place. And the printers didn't work so well, as high-end as it was, uh, so I just collected a lot of scraps of paper. <laughs> so that's what I went to Israel with, just a big roll of these scraps of paper with a bunch of acrylic paint stuffed in the roll and just like left. 
So I did these collage works at the time, figuratively working, sort of residual from college. And I think it was a reaction uh, to having left for the first time New York and just the people around me and sort of portraiture type of work, collage. And this was really just the scraps of paper I had accumulated. Um, what I've always enjoyed and what has ultimately really informed my work to this moment is the fact that you get on a plane perhaps and you really have to pare down. Um, I usually work large can on large canvases and this makes me say, well, what are the bare necessities and how am I gonna do this, right? So I did works on paper and I did a lot of them. And then I came back to New York and it was totally depressing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I luckily got a job where I was sort of a permalancer. That was me doing graphic design again, but for one company about nine months a year. And as soon as they told me that, I started applying to residencies and I started making my travel plans again because once I got that opportunity, I, I have not stopped. Um, so I went to, I left New York a few years later and I went to northern Spain in the uh, Pyrenees Mountains to a village of 20 people. And it's not necessarily agreeable to a lot of New Yorkers to go this extreme, but I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And um, I did this residency, that was my studio. It was an unfinished A-framed space. Sometimes there'd be storms and it wouldn't necessarily work for everybody, but I was just there and able to paint. And I lived in this village and it was pretty amazing. So uh, that's my studio, my makeshift studio. And um, yeah, again, working on paper. But there was an interesting thing that happened. Um, I was in this little village. You had to sort of make arrangements once a week to go to the other little village like an hour away to get your groceries. It was that small. And I was doing the works on paper, but I was like, eh, I could use something else. At the end of the little village was a little wood, wood shop. And the guy gave me some scraps of MDF board that he had lying around. And that opened a completely new uh, door for me. And it was a total situation of circumstance because of where I was. And uh, I have done hundreds of those little boards ever since. They are my go-to um, my go-to uh, practice often. So I paint really big and I paint really small and it all was because I was really confined to a little tiny wood shop at the end of this uh, street, uh, not even a street, in this village. Um, this is my accommodation. Uh, I did pay a small fee to be there, but it was really minimal. And usually for residencies, you have to get yourself there. Um, that hasn't been mentioned. Like wherever it is, you usually have to like arrive and then it might be free or there might be a small stipend. But um, this was just one of the most beautiful places I've, I've ever been. This is a work that resulted from that. And another situation that I found residencies bring to me and have always been great for my practice is it's a confined time span. I work really well with deadlines and I also have to set aside time for like, let's say drying time and all of that. So I was working figuratively uh, here in Spain and I had a couple more days and I just hated this painting I was doing and I completely erased it and this is what happened. And I've been working like that ever since. <laughs> and I had to get it dry. You know, I had three days. I was like, oh my God, it's oil paint. I gotta dry it up. And I just banged that out and I've not kind of stopped working that way. So for me, residencies is not just getting out of Dodge and sort of getting away from your everyday life and that like any vacation, you're sort of able to sort of remove yourself from your everyday life and just get perspective new new light, new visuals, new aesthetics, and just new smells, everything that a vacation type scenario would give you. But, you know, it's the, the time limitation as well as the sort of material limitation has been absolutely wonderful for my practice. Because sometimes, like I paint in my garage, I, always, I do have that flexibility, and being on residencies has sort of taught me that. Like I'm not, not always gonna be able to stretch a large canvas. 
And that's okay, you know, sometimes my garage that I paint in is quite cold. So I'll go and do my small works again. And uh, this is one of the small panels. So it's about eight by 10 uh, that I did in Spain. And uh, another one, this is probably postcard size, but I've just done many of these. And when I got back to New York, all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I could just put these in a shopping bag and put them on the subway and put up a show. It was great. Like all of a sudden my life got so much easier. Um, a few months later, thanks to the job I got as a permalancer, I went to Spain in the south. This was all uh, expenses paid, although I had to get myself there. This was extraordinary in a valley in, uh, near Mohacar, which is just a, a hilly beach town in, the, in very southern Spain. Uh, this is what the dining center was. Uh, this had fabulous food. Um, a bunch of New Yorkers, I was in New York at the time, were put together, so I made some friends. That was clearly, they sort of figured that out, so we would all stay in touch. Um, totally beautiful, rural setting. This is an example of a studio that would have been there. Um, this isn't my studio, I, I grabbed these off of the, uh, the internet, but um, it still looks exactly the same. Um, I did meet up with these people later back in New York at certain times. And again, I, I filled up, this time I knew what I was doing, so I filled up a suitcase of these little panels and made a bunch. This is newer. Um, these are new, but uh, yeah, I, I did panels there and I probably did almost, I don't know, 60 of them or something over the course of a month um, because they were practical. One thing I wanted to insert into this uh, evening was after doing a bunch of residencies and being in New York, I had um, a very nice life in New York that I didn't want to leave and I didn't want to go into debt, but I wanted to go to graduate school. So what has developed in recent years are low residency programs. Uh, and I got my master's, my MFA at the Maine College of Art, which was a residency type master's program. This is a situation, and they're all a little different, Bard has a very reputable one, uh, where you meet for a couple of months in the summer like you would a residency, you work intensively, you're having intensive crits and whatnot, and then you go back to where you live, and they arrange for you to keep up your practice, you check in with them, they have maybe a studio liaison to meet with, and then you maybe go a couple of different times throughout the year, but I didn't have to quit my day job. I didn't have to get into too much debt. Um, I was able to keep my, it really actually integrated my New York studio practice in life into then the, it was like the perfect combination. I, so this was a two year program and that, I did that there. Um, I just threw in some examples of, of um, some work from that time period. Um, eventually I moved to Connecticut. I have two kids, I get married. And uh, my kids are really small, and I knew about Weir Farm because I had friends that had uh, attended Weir Farm. It's like the best kept secret in Connecticut. And um, I had a birthday, a milestone birthday rolling around, and I said, let me see if I can get into this program, even though I have little kids. And I was accepted, uh, so that was great. Um, I sort of treated it nine to five. I did not stay on the premises uh, at night because I came home to my children. Um, but for that month, I arranged to get back uh, to my work. This is the studio there. It's a beautiful setting. This is not a group residency. It's a, you're, you're there by yourself. There's just some work from that time. Uh, and then I returned to Weir uh, for a second time, very recently in this past year. And I did that there. Another sort of, oh my God, I've got to, I got to pack up soon. And I banged that out. So, and then, Works on paper again, though, panel paintings again. Just these things that really happen because I went on residencies are exactly how I work. It, it's, I don't know what came first, but um, yeah. This I had done at Weir. I brought it back to my garage and finished it up. So I'll end, I think I'll end on that one, yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Robert.
I'm curious about the time spans of these various residencies. What are some of the shortest and some of the longest? And in order to achieve the kinds of goals that you all had, um, how much time do you really think you actually need to meet those goals of having the residency experience have a profound impact? It's kind of what you're comfortable with and what your life allows. Yeah, you know, if you have little kids, if you have a job, those are all big things, but. I'm not asking for myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a good question. It's I, a really good question. I think the average would be two, to, two weeks to a month. Yeah. Is that the Two usual? to four weeks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Two to four weeks. Yeah. And they'll ask you how, you know, what your preferred <laughs> slots and when and, you know, rank them one, two, three, um, because they have a calendar to figure it out. While I was down there, they actually said, oh, we have, you could stay another week if you want. So oh, I, I actually okay. could not that time, but maybe next time. Um, VCCA staggers how people mm -hmm. come in and out. So some residencies, I think they start everyone mm -hmm. on the first of the month, and, but ours, uh, people were in and out, and so you sort of got close to people, then they disappear, and then you get new people, and it was interesting. Did you have to say what your goals were when you were applying, and then if you had to do that, did you have to follow up at the end and show that you'd achieved them, or did you have any responsibility? Did they agree? They might have those expectations, yeah. but I, I mean, you could have a proposal, but you're not bound to it. I mean, we're, you're, you're treated as an adult in this situation, and mm -hmm. it's not, it's not a classroom academic situation at all. And if it was, I guess it would be very specified on the application. Yeah. Uh, you are, it's, a, it's a space that's given to you to, to do your work in however you want. It's usually a 24-7 open frame, um, and it's, it's, it's totally blissful. I mean, it's, it, there's no, nothing other than doing your work, how you do it, and in which way you do it. It's, it's really that wonderful, usually from my experience. I think some of them like ask you to do a talk like yeah. mm -hmm. Weir Farm. Yeah. Uh, yeah mine, mine they yeah. didn't ask anything of Or me. open your studio door. Uh, right. for, we for had to that. give a talk, yeah. yeah. We had to give a talk. Was, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the critters. Oh, I'm so glad you did, Leslie. I just <laughs> thought that I forgot to say anything. So that is kind of what's unique about Vermont Studio Center. They have two professional artists, all different types, writers, um, painters, uh, composers, that come up uh, for like a week. They live there, they eat lunch with you. You can make an appointment with them and they'll come to your studio and just uh, talk to you. You don't have to do it. It's a great thing to do though. It's a great, it's a great asset there. I've looked at Anderson Ranch, but they don't allow me to bring my emotional support animal. Do you ever see animals at any of these things? Little dogs that are licensed? Oh. <laughs> that's a good question. Anderson Ranch would be great. I went there, It's a one. that's a great program. My daughter lives there, so I can get a dog sitter, but I'm just wondering if that's ever a thing. Ask. You know? Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, just all. Probably they, depends they on how big it. they I know your dog would be great there. <laughs> yeah, every situation is really so unique and different. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, we heard, so I love hearing about all the successes of being part of So uh, I'll answer that. Um, so I was shooting for 100 rejections in a year, because <laughs> Elise, Elise had passed around this story that actually a writer had written. And it was really about applying, putting yourself out there for residency shows, for in her case, to get into magazines. And um, so I hit like around 18, and then I got in, and it's like, OK, done. But Was it's, there anything different you feel that you did between, or just? No, I, I, no, but I think 
shooting for rejections versus getting in made it feel better when you got rejected. <laughs> it's like, yes, I got rejected again. <laughs> and then I tell Elise and she say, yeah, I got rejected too today. <laughs> So it, it works your mind a good way, actually. I, I was rejected from one today, and it was family-friendly. Oh, so <laughs> I to bring my kids. <laughs> I, it, being rejected makes you want to go all the more. I'm yeah. just you know, like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to get to it. But it's, um, I, I do happen to know for a fact that they uh, pay attention to people that reapply yeah. and reapply That's and reapply. That's just what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah it's, it definitely... Yeah, doesn't go sure. unnoticed and it's but it's they also have different people during people yeah. in mm -hmm. so you never have the same people you it's the luck of the draw yeah and vcca they they try and take 50 percent new people and 50 percent returning people yeah, so um I it's always know. sort of a mix yeah yes exactly. um this is probably one of those of you that went abroad but um i'm wondering if you could talk about shipping your work back yeah. and um, and the challenges that came across, or just advice for I took mine on the plane. <laughs> I, I, I made the mistake of shipping mine back the first time. They said, oh, that's no problem. Just go to the post office and send it. And it didn't come, and it didn't come. And I talked to them every day for like oh. three months. And I, then I just kind of gave up. I thought, OK, I had a great time. You know, it's OK. And one winter day, I, I think I went in like August, I got to the front door and there was my stuff. So, you know, you know it, it's, it's, it's a problem. But I, so after that, I just made sure I always did little stuff and didn't do anything that I had to ship back. It probably went on the boat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a good so you question. Had a pickup truck, right? Yeah, I had a pickup truck and I was limiting where I would apply to, where I could drive to, but yeah. I'd like to go overseas, so I'll have to change my practice. Yeah. Well, just roll them up, roll them up. Right. I did hear, yeah, some people did bring canvases and just right. rolled them up uh -huh. and brought them back on the plane. Yeah. Were you required to donate a piece of art or any work with the residencies or is it just I was not. The one in France, you are asked to leave a piece. Yeah. yeah. And one of mine in Spain, we, I did. Mm -hmm. they're, usually, they, they're usually up front about it in terms of yeah. those expectations. Yeah. Yeah. That would be very clear. It's a nice thing to do, too. Yeah. It's fun to go back and see it there. Yeah. Um, the art supplies you with the restrictions when you go abroad now in terms of especially with oil paints and the nose and stuff. So are you restricted to just water-based, or do you buy your supplies when you're there? How does that It's a good question, because I think it's different it, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Israel, I don't think I was able to bring oil, so I did acrylic. But everywhere else, I was able to ship oil. But it might have changed. I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's worth a consideration. It's, it's worth looking into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I brought everything on the plane. Even the oil. Yeah, you need a few suitcases. I think some people ship in advance. Yeah. yeah. Um, which can be another way of doing it. But obviously, you want it to show up at the other end. <laughs> How important is the written part of the application versus the portfolio of work? Well, um, I think it really depends on the type of residency, for one thing. I don't think there's any hard and fast rules. Um, but some, some places will do uh, like a round where you're just looking at the images um, because ultimately you're look, thinking about the art um, and those written materials may come into factor in in the later stages when they're trying to whittle people down. They might start reading the artist's statement to really get a deeper understanding. Uh, they might start looking um, at the CV uh, just to get a sense of your career and what stage you're at. So those kind of things might play a part in, in the final stages when they're trying to, because often if it's super competitive, they're, yeah. they're actually, you know, they're trying to finalize things. Yeah. Okay, well, we've got like a minute left, but just, just um, this. Um, how important is that you be, um, you know, doing all abstracts in the same style in your application? Because some people are very eclectic and they're working on different bodies or types of work at the same time. 
um, would it be a bad idea to include different things or just make it all consistent? Question. Um, you know, I mean, I think sometimes the, the, the and I mentioned that in there, it's that the cohesive uh, body of work, some people do like to see a sense of the depth rather than the breadth. But having said that, depending on how things are seen, maybe you can show a group of one body and then a group of another. But I think if, you, uh, if you're showing multiple <coughs> different types of work, you've got to find a way for that to link visually so that people really understand it. Um, so that might be, say, uh, an installation shot, if those works are all shown together, for example, right? So that might bring it all together. Sure. I have a question um, in general about your interactions with other people on these residencies and their importance. So it's two parts, really. Um, the single person residency versus the one where you're with other artists or um, other professionals in creative fields. And also, in any of these residencies, did you have valuable interactions with mentors or people who did critiques? Um, who were part, which was part of the residency? Um, well, I really valued listening to the writers and the composers talking about writer's block or how they formulate melodies and how it, it's, I, I found that the composers and, and how I work, sort of I'm very intuitive and I think about color and flow and composition and they were thinking about, you know, beat, the, the, the tempo and the, various, you know, the way, the, the way that the music would flow. So um, I, I found that really great. And then I liked having people around to socialize with, because I think if I was there for a month by myself, I'd probably go a little crazy. Um, so. I had a really interesting experience um, in Brittany. It was a big estate. It's owned by the Maryland Institute and College of Art. This lady donated it. And so there were only three of us. And there was one woman there who never stopped talking. <laughs> and the first night, I went to my room and I thought, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. What am I going to do? What am and it, it was a really good experience because I eventually just kind of figured out a way to work around her schedule <laughs> so that, you know, we weren't, we didn't connect up too often. So you, it's definitely, um, you do run into things like that. It's the only time I ever did, but it's, you know, you have to just go with the flow and it's, 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 it's a good experience, ultimately. It's, you work, you work Jones, through it. Jones has one urgent question that we really need to stop. Yes. Um, in any of the residencies, are there any peers offering critiques? That's what Jay said. Really, not at all, um, unless unless you invited them in. But it was really about you working on your process, and, and you're not really there to get feedback. Um, and some of the artists weren't there to even produce any result. They were just there to to work. So they didn't. No, some of the, a lot of the artists wouldn't even open their doors, and a lot of the writers didn't talk you know, about yeah. their work. I mean, they talked. I mean, I think there's different types. The, the residency that I was on, we, we, what, we each did like a, a, a talk about our work and, and had some sort of critique and uh, did, a, did an exhibition later on with several of the years of this uh, residency program and I ended up collaborating with one of the other artists. Um, and it does, again, depend on the residency. A lot of re residencies will invite people like myself in, and I've done it several times, and it's part of the package. So usually that the expectation is out there that you'll get visits from people. And, um, you know, I've, I'm still in touch with people today that I've had studio visits with. I still visit their, their work, I see their shows. Um, so it's definitely one of the huge benefits of of participating in residences is expanding your network, whether that's other artists but, or other arts professionals. And again, the people running the programs, the arts administrators there, I'm still in touch with many of the artists that were in the residency program I ran and, and, and curated some of them in shows and things like that. So 
Um, it, it's definitely, um, but I think the other thing is the time and space to create. You know, those are all the sort of added benefits, but it's really what, you know, all of you talked about breakthrough moments, and that's, that's really, it does sort of separate yourself from your daily sort of activities and, and gives you that time to focus on your practice. That's a great way of ending. Thank you very much. Thank you.